shut the gate, throw sheets over the roses, go inside, lock all the windows and doors, and go down to the basement to sit on a chair and wait. Sometimes those preparations are enough. The locks on the windows and doors are tight. You've taken the medication faithfully. You've exercised to induce a sense of dopamine calm. You've put every lamp in the house in your office and flipped on the light box. It mimics some sunlight for people who get depressed in winter. And the room is lit up as if with floodlights, and you're so hot you're working in your bra. You've <laughs> stayed off the coffee. You've taken the supplements. You've worked starting at the same time and for the same length every day. You've interacted with human beings at least a few times this week. You've gotten yourself to the point where you sleep in the normal time frame from night until morning, and your mornings are not a horrible struggle to stay out of bed, and you make the bed so you aren't tempted to get back in it. You check off the entries on the list that runs your life. But sometimes the system fails. Maybe it's a chemical shift in the brain that the medications didn't block. Maybe it's a stressor in your life that you didn't expect. Maybe there is no reason, and you're just going mad for the hell of it. But you try not to think about that, because that would imply that no matter what you do, no matter how tightly you batten the hatches, mad madness can still get in. You wake up one morning, and there it is, sitting in an old plaid bathroom in your kitchen, unpleasant and unshaved. You look at it, heart sinking. Madness is a rotten guest. You can tell it to leave till you're blue in the face. You follow it around the house, explaining that it's come at a bad time and could it maybe come another day. Eventually, you give up and go back to bed, shutting the door. But, of course, it barges in and demands to be entertained. Before you know it, it has strewn its stuff all over the house, and there are sticky plates in its bed, and it refuses to change its sheets. Madness lounges all day in front of the TV, watching Oprah and munching on a bag of chips, drinking milk from the carton, and getting crumbs between the cushions of the couch. Soon, your life revolves around it. You do everything you can to keep it comfortable because you don't want to upset it. You tiptoe around the house and wait for it to leave. In most cases, you wake up one morning and it's gone. There's minimal damage. You pick up its mess and get on with your day. But sometimes, it settles in to stay. Immediately, it is all demands. It starts bossing you around, interrupting your conversations, refusing to let you out of the house. The phone stops ringing. Soon, it's just you and madness. You circle each other like boxers. But sometimes, it takes round after round, and you lie on the living room floor, unable to get up. It refuses to let you sleep. You run out of food. It draws all the blinds and stands, peering through the slats. It convinces you you're in danger. It says that people are coming, and they'll hurt you if you let them in. Soon, madness has worn you down. It's easier to do what it says than argue. In this way, it takes over your mind. You no longer know where it ends and you begin. You believe anything it says. You do what it tells you, no matter how extreme or absurd. If, you, if it says you're worthless, you agree. You plead for it to stop. You promise to behave. You are on your knees before it, and it laughs. How do you do it? How do you live with a mental illness? It's not easy. It's a bummer of a deal. It's tiresome and lonely and difficult and often very painful. It's hard on the people who love you. When it's bad, it makes things difficult. Work, love, eating dinner, getting dressed. And when it's very bad, it makes things hell. I know that hell more intimately than I would like, as does anyone with a mental illness, as do all the people who love us. Mental illness can be a monster, no question about it. But it's also a disease. It's a chronic physical disease of the brain. It can be debilitating. It's knocked me out cold more times than I can count, taking friends, jobs, places I've lived, people I've loved. But it can also be managed. And organizations like Vail Place go a long way toward making that possible for people like me. Like any chronic disease, it requires effort, sometimes backbreaking effort, and sometimes not that much effort at all. There are days when the effort I make to manage my mental illness is the effort it takes to get from my bed on the psych ward to the couch down the hall. And there are days when the effort it takes is popping my 25 pills and heading out the door to teach a class. One thing about mental illness, it's never boring. I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, I never tire of the entertainment of my own mind. In truth, people 
people. I tire of the entertainment of my own mind from time to time. I could do with a little less excitement up there, but it is what it is. This is how I look at my mental illness. I figure this is the hand I've been dealt. I'll play it as well as I can. There are times I wish hard for another hand, even another game. But this is the one that I've got. And it has its advantages along with its drawbacks. We are, all of us, more or less a product of our own minds. Our minds are the seat of all we think and feel and say and do. And I wouldn't trade who I am. I'm not even sure I'd trade some of the experiences I've had as a result of my mental illness. I'd love it if things were a little easier for me, but wouldn't we all? How do you live with a mental illness? This is how I live with mine. I accept it. I don't fight it anymore. This doesn't mean I surrender to its control. It doesn't mean I just give up and accept devastation when it runs riot. It means I accept what it is, an illness, one I have, and one I can treat. The greatest myth about mental illness, believed all too often, even by those of us who have one, is that it's a death sentence. That it spells the end of normal life, of joy, of real relationships, of a life lived fully in the world. It doesn't. Mental illness is highly treatable, far more so than the average person is aware. That lack of awareness accounts for the painful stigma that surrounds the conditions as well as the lack of willingness to put money behind research for new and better treatments and support systems like Vail Place that would reach the millions of mentally ill people who need them. And that's what makes Vail Place and the people who support it so special. It recognizes that through all the difficulties mental illness presents, there is also enormous hope. Hope that can be tapped with the right services and supports, and Vail Place is doing just that. It fights the perception so many of us have, and I believed this myself for years, that a diagnosis is a death knell, and that there's no way to live well when you're mentally ill. Fail Place knows better, and you offer your members an enormous gift in showing them that so much more is possible. I am grateful to have learned that myself. My life today is better than I ever could have dreamed it would be back in the days when I refused to accept the fact that I do indeed have bipolar and I do indeed need to manage it. There were all the years before I was diagnosed when I tried so hard to convince myself that nothing was wrong, I was really okay, if I just tried a little harder, I could be like everyone else, if I just hit it a little longer, no one would know. And then there were the years after diagnosis when I was so terrified of becoming the stereotypical bag lady that I refused to believe I even had a mental illness. That refusal to acknowledge and accept was what finally flung me into the hell I know as madness. And it was accepting that the way out was through surrender. That, sorry, <laughs> that finally brought me up to solid ground. But I'm skipping ahead. Let me tell you a little bit about how I got here. For me, it goes way back. Wherever the code for mental illness may be inscribed on my DNA, it first showed its face when I was a child. Diagnosis was nearly 20 years away. That was back in the 70s, long before anyone was seriously talking about mental illness in children, long before my parents could have any idea what was going on, and long before I myself would be able to understand the reasons why I thought and felt so differently from the other kids. I knew something was wrong. We all knew something was wrong, but we didn't know what, and we didn't know why. It wasn't long before the mayhem set in for real. Soon, my family and I were caught in the revolving door of therapists' offices, hospitals, and psych institutions. First one diagnosis, and then another, sometimes accurate, sometimes not. And I grabbed at anything I could find to try to control the spinning in my head. I careened back and forth from straight A's to expulsions, from awards for writing to, to expulsions for fighting, from starving myself half to death, to cutting myself up, to drinking my weight in stolen booze. The mood swings of bipolar carried me to spectacular elated highs to suffocating dark lows. My parents were frantic, my teachers were baffled, my friends laughed at my never-ending jokes and tried not to look as I grew steadily skinnier 